How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, friends. Joining us via satellite and those of you in our Manhattan studios in New York, what an exciting evening we have in store for you tonight. This entire weekend is going to be one that is spellbinding, gripping, at times controversial, but you'll find out how enlightening it is, and we are so glad that you have chosen to take this Friday evening to join with us here in New York. And now, friends, let's join together as we welcome this evening Pastor Doug Batchelor. Good evening, friends. Thank you so much for coming for another edition of the Millennium of Prophecy. We have a very important, and I think you'll find enjoyable study that we're going to engage in tonight. Before we do, it's time for our Bible questions. And so I'd like to invite the engaging Mrs. Batchelor to come out and join me on the platform. We have been going through stacks and stacks of questions and letters from around the world. And we want to thank you. We want to take a moment and thank those who are writing us and emailing us for the wonderful positive comments that are coming in. Uh, I hope you understand it's impossible for us to answer each one of them because there are literally thousands of them. But we do appreciate your kind words and the questions that are coming in. Also, I was just wondering, did any of you have a good day off yesterday? The boys and I had a wonderful opportunity to go to the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island with the Bible workers, and we were really encouraged and excited about what we saw there. And you know what really hit me as I was in Ellis Island looking around? There were 5,000 people coming in daily, and about 2% of the 5,000 people that came in daily were turned back, were turned away because of medical problems, because of paperwork problems, or because of other issues that came up, and they were sent back to their home where they were persecuted, where, they were, where there was poverty, where there was just really incredible uh, situations for them to live in. And you know, it reminded me about salvation. We talked about salvation last time we were together. And Christ opens the door and welcomes all of us to, be, to come to Him and be saved. Mm -hmm. And He never turns any of us back, regardless of our, our medical situation, regardless of our financial status. Mm -hmm. God always accepts us and welcomes us, and we're really excited about that. Amen. I want to encourage you to, to, to look at salvation as if being something that me, you would like to do. I will not turn Him away. Yep, Jesus. that's really Amen. exciting. All right, we're ready to go into our questions. Okay, let's Are you take ready? a look. All right, number one. Is a sin a sin if you do not know that it is a sin? <laughs> is a sin a sin if you don't know it's a sin? Well, not necessarily. Let me explain. Mom is making cookies, and she doesn't want the kids to eat any cookies until after dinner, but she has not articulated that. If the children take one of the cookies off the table and eat it, and uh, they did not know, they are not as culpable, they're not as guilty as if it, they had been told. The Bible says if we continue to sin after, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, if we continue to sin after we have received the knowledge of the truth. And I believe that uh, the Lord tells us in James, sin is for him who knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. So uh, the Lord expects more of us when we know his will than we don't. But if we're breaking God's commandments, it's still sin, but we're treated dif differently because the Lord judges us based on our understanding of his will. There, all sin is deadly, but there are varying degrees of sin. Are you aware of that? The Bible says there were different kinds of sacrifices for sin. And so that, of course, would uh, support that. Several people have asked this question. Who is Michael the Archangel? Michael the Archangel. I used to think, you know, you got 
I heard when I went to Catholic school about Raphael, and then I found out Raphael is not in the Bible, but Michael is. And you hear about these different angels. And I thought Michael, he was, you know, the chief angel. And then I started doing some studies, and I, I looked at some commentaries, like Matthew Henry's commentary and some others, and I discovered Michael is another name for Christ. Stay with me. Follow me. I am not saying that Jesus is an angel. Revelation chapter 12 tells us there was war in heaven. The dragon, who's the dragon? Satan. That's a symbolic name for Satan. The dragon and his angels fought with Michael. Now, if dragon is a symbolic name for the devil, the prince of evil, it's possible that Michael is a symbolic name for the prince of good. You read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Lord himself, uh, verse 16, shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. The Lord descends with the voice of the archangel. Now, do you know what the word Michael means? Michael means who is as God. Who is as God. Not a question, a statement. Archangel, well, an angel means messenger. Archangel means you know, the arch stone, and that's what Karen was referring to when she called him the archangel. An arch stone was the top of a Roman arch. It, the keystone held everything. It meant the highest or greatest. The name, Michael the archangel, what it means is the greatest messenger who is as God. That's what the name means. Now, do you remember in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the book of Joshua? The Bible tells us that this angelic general appeared to Joshua. And he falls down before the angel, and the angel says, take your shoes off because this is holy ground. When John the Apostle went to worship a regular angel, the angel said, don't do that. I'm an angel. The commandment says, worship God only. Yet Joshua was told to worship this general of the Lord's army. Often in the Bible, the Lord is called the Lord of hosts. You've heard that expression? That means the Lord of armies. Christ is the captain of the angels, you see. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince who stands in behalf of the children of thy people. Who is the one who stands on our behalf? Jesus. Christ. Amen. Now, when I first heard this, I, it took me a while to digest it. But, you know, speaking of this angel that appeared to Manoah and his wife when Samson was born, an angel appeared, and they made an offering unto him. We're not supposed to make offerings to, to regular creatures, to God only. They said, what is your name? He says, my name is Wonderful. Have you read Isaiah? One of the names of Jesus, his name shall be called Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, the Bible tells us that before Abraham was, I am. Christ in the Old Testament appeared a number of times to some of these characters in the form of a messenger of God. I'm not saying he was a cherub or a seraphim, but remember the word angel means a messenger. King David was called an angel. doesn't mean he had wings and feathers. It means he was a messenger of God. Christ brought the greatest message. Michael, I believe, is another name for Jesus. If you want more scripture, write it down. Uh, matter of fact, I just wrote a whole article on this. You can get from Amazing Facts by looking at our website. Okay. This next question, I think, is going to be too long for your minute and a half. Okay. Let's see how far we get. Can you please explain the deity? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, three separate personalities. In Genesis, it says, God said, let us make man in our image. There's the pluralness of God, and yet Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. How can you reconcile there being the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and one? Very simply, in the Hebrew mind, one did not always mean numerical quantity. One meant unity. Amen. We two get married, we become one family, one flesh. Uh, you can have one team. At the baptism of Jesus, you've got God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, and God the Spirit descending. Jesus said, go therefore baptize in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. I'm paraphrasing here, Matthew 28. And so you can find the three persons of the Trinity all the way from cover to cover in the Bible. Someone asked about Daniel chapter 7, where it talked about uh, the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and the Son of Man came before him. And so you've got those several examples there. If you want more information on that, write it down again. I've got more to share. Well, are there, okay. When we get to heaven, will we see three different persons? I believe that God consists of three separate persons. You had three separate persons at the baptism in three separate geographic spots. When Jesus, God the Son, prayed, he prayed to his Father who was in heaven. Two geographic positions. I believe they're three separate identities.
Okay, just one re dot. really quick. Will our pets be in heaven? Will our pets be in heaven? Well, it depends how good they've been. No. <laughs> you know, this is a very sensitive question, and it comes in every seminar. The Bible does tell us there are animals in heaven. There is no scripture that says that Jesus died to redeem Fido and Tweety Bird and our animals. <laughs> I need to tell you what the Bible says, but I'll also give you a little hope. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. You may get to your mansion and find a little glorified mansion for Fido right there. All right. Put it past the Lord. That's right. At this time, we'd like to welcome our, our musical guests this evening. Herman and Sonny Harp are full-time Christian artists whose desire is to share the wonderful gospel story through their music and testimony. Sonny brings years of experience to their ministry as a soloist, songwriter, arranger, and keyboardist. Herman is a soloist, guitarist, and violinist who has been sharing Christian music for over 40 years. This evening, they're going to share with us the song that Sonny wrote, Blessed Are They. Amen. Thank you so much. Herman and Sonny Harp, appreciate that very much. And the song that they did tonight actually goes right along with our study guide, which is dealing with the law of God. It's a serious lesson tonight. What's the matter? Oh, no. What, what did I do? So you're telling me that I have something on my forehead? Oh, I don't see anything on my forehead. <laughs> Will it distract you if I go on and teach the lesson like this? Some of you said, no, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> How are you going to prove I have something on my forehead? I need a what? Where am I going to find a mirror? In the Bible? I need a mirror. Let me see if I could... Uh, what do you know? Brother John just so happens to have a mirror. 
and a microphone. Now take the microphone away from him. <laughs> okay, let's see now. I've got very careful uh, personal hygiene habits and uh, I washed my face and took care of things before I came today and you're telling me that I've got a mark on my face. I don't see a mark on my face. Still don't see a mark on my face. But you can see if you've got one on yours, right? Oh. Hey, you know, I felt rather comfortable until I looked in this mirror. So obviously, if I felt okay until I looked in the mirror, the problem is I need to get rid of the mirror. Is that right? No. Well, let's see here. Let's use some uh, logic. If the mirror could show me that there's a spot on my face, it would stand to reason that the mirror could take it away. Wait a second. You mean it's going to make me feel bad and show me there's something wrong and not do anything about it? person could come to the place where they would really dislike mirrors. And incidentally, there are some who do. So what am I going to do? <laughs> now everything's worse. What do I do? What do I need? Washcloth. Wash where am I going to find a washcloth? Just so happen to have one. Wait. <laughs> a red cloth to take a black spot off of a white face? Let's watch this. <laughs> I knew he'd want to say something. <laughs> For one thing, it makes that look a little better. Here, let's see if this thing works. You have no idea the scientific preparation that went involved in doing this. Hey, one time I made the mistake of doing this illustration with permanent marker. Not bad, eh? <laughs> now, do you know what the illustration... Now i got a red, wash, red mark on my head. You know what this illustrates? What does this represent? The law of God. This is the blood of Jesus. And this was... The mark was sin. The purpose of the law is simply to show us our sin so we go to Jesus for cleansing. Yet there are a lot of people, even in the religious world today, who are telling us that Jesus died to take away the law from us, when in reality, the law is necessary to send us to Christ for cleansing. The devil hates the law of God, and we're going to explain a lot of your questions on the relationship between the law, the Ten Commandments, the laws that are done away with. You need to understand this in order to understand prophecy. Now, amazing facts went out on the streets in Manhattan. We wanted to get a feel from the people here in this big city to find out how do they react to the law of God? Do they think the Ten Commandments are still relevant today? I want you to take a look at some of the responses that we received. I believe the Ten Commandments are relevant because today we have to have some kind of moral background or moral fiber to keep us all in focus and harmony together. I am a Christian and I do think the Ten Commandments are relevant today. As for religion per se, my belief is if the person is good, they don't need religion. Yes, I believe they are relevant today because um, it's just everyday living, you know, things that people should know in school, especially young kids. Yes, I do think they're relevant. Not really because I don't think anybody follows the Ten Commandments. I don't even think half the people know what they are. Yes, I believe that um, team commitment are important because um, it still um, has uh, good values. And I think um, students need to learn good stuff. I believe that the Ten Commandments are important today because Jesus, when he came preaching the kingdom of God, he said that the most important commandment was for us to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And that is of the Ten Commandments 1 through 4. And then he also said that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. We should definitely still keep the Ten Commandments because God's word still exists. His word is still alive and it still exists today and as yesterday, even as today. I believe that the Ten Commandments are important to each person in their own way. But I, I do believe that it's been loosely <laughs> translated now. And um, it basically depends on what kind of a person you want to be. 
interesting spectrum of answers that people have there about how we're supposed to relate to the law of God. You know what I wanted to do? Those who said, yes, I think we should keep them, I was going to say, could you please name them for me? <laughs> you know, I found out even going to Christian schools that maybe one out of 20 can name the Ten Commandments. You know, this is a very serious lesson, a very important study. And before we enter into it, I'd like to invite you at home and you here to once again bow your heads with me and to pray that God's Spirit will give us understanding this is a very critical issue when it relates to prophecy. Loving Father, we earnestly pray now for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our minds that you might instruct us with the Holy Spirit. Give us understanding, Lord, and then even more important, help us to apply the things we learn from your word to our lives, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Now, some of you might be thinking, Doug, this is a prophecy seminar. Why are we coming to find out about the Ten Commandments during this prophecy lecture? If you've read your Bible, you know in the last days in Revelation, there will be a law made that all the world must worship the beast and the image to the beast. We need to know what laws to keep and what laws not to keep. You remember reading in the Old Testament the story where the king of Babylon made an image and he told everybody to pray to the image. And three Hebrews would not pray to the image and they were thrown in the furnace, but God blessed them as a result of their fortitude and their faith. I want to start with an amazing fact. And uh, I need to get these details for us. Uh, this actually applies to our study tonight. An amazing fact about the, the crime in North America. Theft. The U.S. Commerce Department has released some shocking figures. I'll help you understand why the Ten Commandments are important. About four million people are caught shoplifting each year. But for every person caught, it's estimated 35 go undetected. If the estimates are accurate, it means that 140 million shoplifting incidents occur each year in a nation of 260 million. This is just North America. According to a study in Washington, few shoplifters steal out of need. 70% of shoplifters are in the middle income bracket. 20% had high incomes. Only 10% would be considered poor. Now I'll share more about my personal testimony, but my mother was at least middle class, and I remember her taking me to Macy's and Bloomingdale's and showing me how to shoplift. <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> Furthermore, according to the insurance statistics, 30% of all business failures each year are a direct result of internal theft. Security officials estimate that 9% of all employees steal on a regular basis. 75% of all employees in retail establishments steal to some degree, taking three times as much as shoplifters. Hotel managers just count on it that one out of three guests is going to steal something from their room. It's built into the budget. The result of this plundering public is that prices everywhere skyrocket up because of profit losses and increased security overhead. The most astounding fact is that there are some pastors who are contributing to this epidemic of shoplifting and crime. And you'll understand that more as we proceed a little further with our lesson. Now we want to take you to our historical about the law of the king. You remember a little bit of rehearsal that the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, had a wild feast. And in the party, he began to mock the God of heaven, and he used these holy vessels to praise the gods of silver and gold and wood and stone and clay. And as a result of that, this handwriting appeared on the wall, and it pronounced the judgment on Babylon. They didn't know what the handwriting meant, so they brought in Daniel. And Daniel then interpreted it. Meeny, meeny, tekel, you farsin, you are weighed in the balances and found wanting, and your kingdom is now divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Matter of fact, that very night, the Medes and the Persians were diverting the Euphrates River where it went under the walls of Babylon, and the kingdom of Babylon fell. All of the, the government officials and the cabinet that had served Belshazzar were executed with one exception. That old patriarch and prophet named Daniel, he was spared because he had an excellent spirit in him. A matter of fact, he became one of the prime advisors for King Darius of the, the Median king. And Darius was so impressed with the wisdom 
and the commitment and the honesty of Daniel, he was thinking about putting Daniel in charge of the whole empire of Medo-Persia, prime minister. Well, when the other Medo-Persian government officials heard that, they were outraged that they would take this captive from Judah and that they would be replaced. They went before the king and they sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Had private detectives following him around, trying to find something that he was doing wrong. But they found he was faithful in every area of his life. Finally, they persuaded the king to make a law. And this, the idea was, you make this religious political law and it will weld the kingdom together. together. That's why Nebuchadnezzar made the golden statue to try and create solidarity, um, solidarity among all these different nations. Make a law that nobody should pray to anybody but you for the next 30 days. And the king thought, well, yeah, well, that make the kingdom stronger and it appealed to his ego, so he signed it into law. And the Bible tells us the law of the Medes and the Persians cannot be changed. It says it four times. It cannot be changed. And they knew that. Now, this scripture really stirs me with emotion. It tells us in Daniel chapter 6, verse 15, or verse 10, I'm sorry, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he knew about the death decree. He went into his house, his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, and he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he had always done. Daniel could have used that scripture where Jesus said, enter into your closet and shut the door. But he was not going to hide his relationship with God. He flung his windows open. He prayed toward Jerusalem. He got on his knees where he was in a physical posture of prayer, and he prayed out loud. He put the law of God ahead of the law of man. The law of God said, thou shalt not have other gods, and that even means the king of Persia, even if it means you're going to lose your job, even if it means you're going to lose your life. Did God honor Daniel for his faithfulness? Sure enough. Well, you know, the spies were watching, and pretty soon they ran to the king. And they said, King, you know you made that law, and the law does not change that if anybody prays to any god or man for 30 days except you, he's going to the lion's den. And that was a death decree back in those days. These were ferocious Asian lions. And the king said, that's right, that's the law. And they said, that Daniel from the captivity of Judah, he broke your law, and the king was outraged. He did everything he could to try and find some legal loophole to save Daniel, but there was nothing he could do. And so finally, regrettably, he had to go ahead and fulfill the law. The king could not change the law. And the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, who you serve from time to time, occasionally, when it's convenient, your God, who you serve continually, he will deliver you. He might deliver you. Friends, you know, that's a wonderful promise. If you serve God continually, he will deliver you. And there is a similar test coming to the people of this planet. That's why we need to learn. So a stone was placed on the mouth of the lion's den, just as a stone was placed on Christ's tomb. And it was sealed with a government seal, just as there was a government seal placed on the tomb of Jesus. And the king then went and he spent the night in fasting back at his palace. First thing in the morning, he came to the lion's den and he pulled the cover off and he called to Daniel and he said, Daniel, has your God who you serve been able to deliver you? They'd never heard anybody talking out of the lion's den before. Nobody had ever come out of the lion's den before. And a voice came up and the king's mouth dropped open and he said, King, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth and they have not hurt me because I was innocent before you and before God. And Daniel was brought out of the lion's den. Now some people think, well, this was no miracle. Well, the lions just weren't hungry. You know, they had just eaten scores of Babylonian politicians and they were probably laying with swollen bellies at the bottom of the den burping and they couldn't eat another groaned and rolled over when Daniel was thrown in there this was no miracle you know a lot of people get into trouble because they don't keep on reading in the Bible reminds me about a story where a young man went to a mission here in New York City and after he accepted the Lord his life was changed they gave him a Bible he went and sat in park bench there in Central Park and started reading the Bible and he couldn't contain himself. He was so excited. He had never known these things before. Pretty soon he said, thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He'd heard him say that back at the mission. He wanted to express his gratitude to God. 
Well, there was an atheist walking by, and he heard the young man with all this religious expression. He said, well, why are you shouting like this? Oh, and the young Christian man said, sir, this is wonderful. I'm reading in the Bible where the Lord parted the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went over on dry ground. And this distinguished-looking atheist said, a young man, I don't mean to burst your bubble, but it was the Sea of Reeds, and it was only six inches deep. Well, he looked so distinguished and intelligent, the young convert didn't want to contradict him, and he said, thank you, I didn't realize that, appreciate that. Just as the atheist got a little ways away, he heard the young man shouting, praise the Lord, hallelujah, this is wonderful. And he came back over, he said, now why are you shouting? He said, mister, Lord just drowned the whole Egyptian army in six inches of water. <laughs> Now, if you don't think the lions were hungry, the Bible says, then they took the men who had accused Daniel and they threw them in the lion's den and the lions had the mastery of them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever hit the bottom. This was a miracle. Now it's time for us to get into our study of the law of God. Question number one. Can the moral law, that's another word for the Ten Commandments, be amended or repealed? Some people say the law of God, the Ten Commandments, were abolished when Jesus died on the cross. Let's find out if that's true. Luke 16, 17. Say the answers out loud with me here in Manhattan. And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass than for one tittle, that's like a little dot of an eye, of the law to fail. Psalms 89, 34. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. This was part of the covenant. Psalms 111, verse 7 and 8. All of his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. Is it sounding eternal to you? Keep reading here. Malachi 3, 6, one of my favorites. Jesus is telling us in his word, I am the Lord, I change not. Hebrews tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ said, He that hears these words of mine is like a wise man who builds his house on rock. What was the Ten Commandments written on? Rock. It's of an eternal nature. Christ is called the rock of ages. Now, the idea that these mortal kings like Darius and others could not change their law, and yet the God of the universe is going to change his law, is absurd. King Herod made a law. He told Salome, if you dance for me, I'll give you whatever you want up to half my kingdom. She said, I want the head of John the Baptist. Herod didn't want to do that, but the king's word was law, and so John the Baptist had to die. You've heard of King Ahasuerus, married to Esther. He signed a law that all the Jews should be exterminated and attacked on a certain day. Then his wife let him know that she was a Jew. He could not change his law. All he could do was write another law that gave them the right to defend themselves. A king's word was law, and the law could not change. If these earthly, vacillating monarchs could not change their law, where in the world do people get the idea that the Almighty, who wrote his law with his finger and spoke it with his voice, would change the Ten Commandments? They're eternal for all people. Some people think they're just for the Jews, and that's also equally absurd. I've got a lot to say. I better go on. Let me tell you why it's important to understand God's law is still in effect. The devil hates the law because by the law is the knowledge of sin. When we see our sin, we then go to Jesus for cleansing. If the devil can get rid of the law, we are not aware of our sin. We don't need Christ. Do you understand the logic? We need the law, but the mirror cannot wash away our sin. It's the blood of Christ that we need. Now, I've got a slide here or two that will show you a, cor a correlation here between the nature and character of God and His law. Look at the similarities. God is good, Luke 18, 19. The Bible says in Romans 7, 12, the law is good. The Bible tells us that God is holy. It says in Romans 7, 12, His law is holy. God is just, Deuteronomy 32, 4. It tells us His law is just. And I'm going to hasten along here. God is perfect. He is love, He is righteous, He is truth, He is pure, He is spiritual, He is unchangeable, He is eternal, and it also says His law is the same thing. Love, righteousness, truth, pure, spiritual, unchangeable, eternal. Are you getting the picture? The law of God is an expression of who He is. It's an expression of His will and His character. Any attack on the Ten Commandments is in reality an attack on the person of God. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then Christ said, I am the truth. 
any degree that we embrace or reject the truth, to some extent we are embracing or pushing away God himself. That's why these issues are so important, and they're going to play in a very prominent way in prophecy. Number two, according to the Bible, what is sin? Answer, 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. And then again, Romans 3, 20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Do we still need to know what sin is? Absolutely. You know, we're living in a society where we're all being told, don't feel guilty. Guilt is bad. Nobody should feel guilty. No matter what you're doing, don't feel bad about it because guilt is bad. Well, guilt is bad. Jesus came to take away your guilt. But here's the part that people miss. You should feel guilty until you have had your sins washed away. Nothing is more dangerous for a person to walk away from the emergency room in terminal condition thinking that they're just fine when treatment is available. You see what I'm saying? And so for the doctor to say, looks like poison ivy to me when it's really skin cancer, he's not doing you a favor, but I don't want to make him feel bad. You've got to be honest about what your condition is, right? And if we are sinful and if we are guilty, you need to know that. And then you go to God and he takes your guilt away. See, I don't live under a burden of guilt from all the terrible things I've done because I believe that he's forgiven me. I could never stand before you otherwise. But if you are guilty, you should feel guilty until you are forgiven. You got that? And the law might make you feel that way. But that's healthy. Number three, to what law does 1 John 3, 4 refer? What law is it talking about? Is it the moral law, ceremonial law? It tells us Romans 7, 7, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. There is a lot of law-breaking in the world today. Well, incidentally, that verse is telling us clearly about the, the disobedience of the Ten Commandments. We can see there's a lot of dishonesty, a lot of money changes hands under the table, a lot of immorality. You heard some of the interviews on the streets. We wish you had more time to play more. People have these really distorted concepts of what's right and wrong because there are no moral absolutes. A little while ago, Time Magazine had a, an issue, infidelity, another word for marital adultery, you know. It might be in our genes. In other words, we're not responsible. And the article basically says, because of our ancestry to the apes, and because apes and chimpanzees are not always monogamous, we can't help when we kind of fool around and, and you know, cheat on our spouses because it's in our genes, we're not responsible. That sounds like the politically correct answer. Another article, Newsweek, bisexuality, not gay, not straight, a new sexual identity emerges. Now, I need to say something before I go any farther. This is an epidemic in our culture. I'm a pastor. I have a lot of church members that struggle with these issues. I've got a belief that part of the reason for the epidemic of bisexuality and homosexuality, there's several factors. One of them is the deterioration of the families. Another one is that the blending of all the distinction between the sexes. We've got the, the, the clothes and the patterns and the styles and everything is all merged and melted together where kids, they grow up and they don't know what they are anymore. But the Bible says that there is a difference between men and women. And that is a distinction that should be maintained. And not only is adultery a sin between heterosexuals, homosexuality is a sin too. I'm glad that God can give us victory over all sin. But, you know, the, the, the media is trying to tell us that it just doesn't matter. Whatever feels good, do it. Look at these interesting statistics. High school problems that were noted back in 1940, teachers said were things like talking out of turn, chewing gum. These were the primary things that they objected to. Making noise in class, running in the hall, cutting line, dress code infractions, littering. By 1990, these were the major concerns among teachers. Drug use, alcohol abuse, Pregnancy, suicide, rape, robbery, assault. You can also look at what's happened with the divorce statistics. 1870, there was one divorce for every 34 marriages. 1900, one in 12. 1930, one divorce for every six marriages. 1978 to 1998, one in two. Actually, that's not an accurate figure because a lot of people now just sort of shack up and never get married and they have no way of tracking that, right? We're in a society where we're just acting like animals. The sanctity of marriage has evaporated. 
And the Bible tells us that that does make a difference. During that time period between 1940 and uh, 1980, violent crime has gone up 560%. Illegitimate births have gone up 400%. Divorce, 400%. Single parent homes, 300%. Teenage suicide. And here's my point. When I went to public school in California was the last time I remember. I, I was born in Burbank, but I ended up growing up in Manhattan. But I was in first, second grade in California. They had the Ten Commandments on the wall in public school. Does anyone else remember that, or am I that old? <laughs> now, that's, oh, no, you can't do that. That's religion and politics. But since there's been this attack on the law of God, both from politicians and from the politically correct and from even some religious groups, can you see a deterioration in our society? There are no absolutes anymore. Nothing is absolutely right or wrong. Everything is situation ethics, whatever feels good. It's like uh, some of our interviewees were, were claiming. America the violent. I heard just recently that uh, for the month of October, there were about 503 murders in New York. Last year, this year, there were 540. It's gone up about 38%. It's much better than it used to be six years ago. They were up to, what was it, 2,000. So I'm glad for the improvement. But it looks like it's on the rise again, and that's disconcerting. It's a violent country. You've seen all the things about the guns and the kids and the schools, and everybody's wanting to think the problem is that there's too many guns. I don't want to enter into that debate, friends, but I still think that's a crazy diversionary tactic. You can kill people with knives. I'm a pilot. I remember a few years ago, someone tried to kill the president with an airplane. Any of you remember that? I thought, oh, man, there's going to be a 10-day waiting period before I can fly my plane. I mean, just everybody wants to... And then after the whole episode with O.J. Simpson, I thought, you're going to have to register your kitchen knives. And, and do you see what I'm getting at? Is the problem really there are too many weapons, or is it that there's no self-control? There's a problem with self-control. I'm not saying there, there isn't a problem with the proliferation of guns. I think there is. The average teenager also, and what we see that's happening in our minds, the average teenager, 18 years old, has witnessed 200,000 violent acts on television, including 40,000 murders by the time they reach 18. Is it any wonder that they're callous and indifferent to the death and suffering of others? The Bible says you are changed by beholding. This lawlessness is leading some religious leaders to propose legislating morality. Now, I need to explain something before we go any further, and it may be new for you. The Ten Commandments were written on how many tables of stone? Two. Two. Front and back. Have you read that? It says on both sides, front and back. You read it there in Deuteronomy. With the finger of God. Now, I heard one rabbi explain that's because it was a covenant, it was a contract, and whenever you make a contract, each party has a copy. On one side of one tablet were the first four commandments. On the other side were the last six. Then there was a duplicate. They were both placed in the Ark of the Covenant in the center of the temple of God in the Holy of Holies. God divided the Ten Commandments because he wanted us to make a distinction. No government should dictate that its people must keep the first four commandments. When a government starts telling you who to worship and what his name is and when to worship him and how to worship him, you've got a religious tyranny. We should all have religious freedom. The government shouldn't be telling us how and who and when to worship. Am I right? Amen. But what happens to a culture when they start saying the last six commandments don't matter? When the government does not respect the institution of marriage or person's property, when everybody's suing because they're all coveting everybody's stuff? You missed a good chance to agree with that. We're so happy in this country. Everybody's suing everybody for everything. When we don't respect the sanctity of marriage, People are killing the sanctity of life. When a government does not uphold and endorse the last six, you've got chaos and anarchy. There is a distinction. Now, the reason I say that is some very sincere but misguided religious teachers are trying to push the government to enforce the Ten Commandments. As a whole, that's a dangerous thing. Then you've got the other extreme. You've got some religious leaders who are saying, we're not under the law, we're under grace, we don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. Where am I? Question number four. Did Jesus keep the Ten Commandments? What is a Christian? He's a follower of Christ. Did Jesus keep them? Answer, John 15, 10, I have kept my Father's commandments. 
It's important for us to know that if we follow him, we will do the same. Number five, how many people have sinned? All. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God with the exception of one being that came to this earth. Who is that? God became a man. His name was Jesus, Yahshua. He came to earth. He lived a sinless life. Some people say he lived a sinless life so we can go on sinning. No, that's not why he did it. He did it as an example on how we can overcome. Have you read Revelation chapter 7? I'm sorry, Revelation chapters 2 and 3? Seven times it says, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes, to him that overcomes. You'll never convince me, friends. God gave me the victory over smoking and drinking and lying and stealing, and I've still got a ways to go. But I believe God can really change you. He can help you be different. Otherwise, what is Christianity? It's a club? It's like, you know, you've got insurance that's out there somewhere, but you keep on living the same life? No, it's more than that, much more. Amen. Number six, what is the punishment for living a life of sin? Very serious. The penalty is death. Those who are not saved from their sins. Now, there's two aspects of being forgiven. When you come to the Lord and you ask for mercy, no matter how bleak or terrible your past is, doesn't matter what kind of scoundrel you were, you come to the Lord in faith and you repent and you confess, He will forgive you right then and there just like you are. Just like you are is called justification. But then after you've accepted this forgiveness, you're so grateful that He's made you righteous for Christ's sake, you now love Him and you want to live a different life. You're not trying to be good to be saved. He saves you just like you are, but then when you are saved, you want to be different and you want to obey Him and do those things that please Him. Does that make sense? Yeah, that should be the motive. Number seven, some say the Ten Commandments are not binding for New Testament Christians. What does Jesus say about this? How many of you have heard this before? New Testament Christians are not under the law. I'm going to explain what under the law means and what it doesn't mean. Say the answers with me. Matthew 19, 17, if thou wilt enter into life, keep my commandments. You can read John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, what needs to be the motive? Keep my commandments if you love me. John, I'm sorry, Revelation 22, 14. Blessed, that means happy are they that do his commandments, that they might have a right to enter through the gates and eat from the tree of life. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. All through the New Testament, it's very clear. God wants us to keep his commandments. Some are saying, oh, wait, the, those are the new commandments. The new commandments are love the Lord and love your neighbor. Those two new commandments are a summary of the ten. But when someone says, I don't worry about the ten commandments anymore because I love my neighbor. Yeah, I know I kill and I steal from him, but I love him. <laughs> well, no, if you love your neighbor, you're going to keep the last six commandments. And if you love the Lord, you want to keep the first four. Love is the fulfilling of the law. When you really love the Lord, you naturally want to obey. How many of you have children? You know, the law says you're not supposed to murder your children. And that's probably what's keeping you from murdering your children, right? <laughs> you think about it every day, but you say, I don't want to go to jail for life. Because there's a law, I better not kill them. You don't even think about the law because you love them. Am I right? Do you see how it works with God? When you really fall in love with God, the law's not a bird. You don't think about it. You want to please Him because you love Him. All right. Number eight. Is that where we are now? How is it possible to keep the commandments? Is it really possible to obey God? Romans 8, 3 and 4. God sending His own Son condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. He fulfills it in us. Philippians 1, 6. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. And then you can go to Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I remember doing a television debate with a couple of ministers who disagreed with me. And they said, we don't need to keep the law. We're not under the law. Nobody can keep the law. I said, so you mean when God asks us to keep the Ten Commandments, He's asking the impossible? Well, yes. I said, no, wait a second. Do you believe the devil can tempt us to sin? And these preachers said, uh, yeah. I said, do you think God can keep you from sin? I've been, I've been, I've been. <laughs> they saw where their logic was going. They were basically saying the devil's big enough to get us to break God's law, 
but Christ isn't big enough to keep us from breaking it. My Bible tells me greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There's a lot of people out there that have more faith in their devil than their God. And they keep wanting to find excuses for sin. Now, don't get discouraged. I'm not preaching that you must be perfect, but I'm saying that if you're going to be a Christian, there should be a consistency of obedience. Instead of making excuses for your sin, whenever you sin, you should be grieved that you've crucified the Son of God afresh. We're making so many excuses for what we're already very good at that it's, it's a dangerous attitude for Christians relating to the law of God. Number nine. What was the Old Covenant and why did it fail? Deuteronomy 4.13. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. Are you there yet? Remember when Moses went up the mountain? He got the Ten Commandments. How many of them were there? The Old Covenant was the Ten Commandments written on stone by the finger of God and spoken by God's voice. Now, there was a problem with the Old Covenant. You remember after Moses came back down the mountain, they had built a golden calf and they'd broken all ten of them. And it says in Hebrews 8, 8, for finding fault with them, he saith, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Now get this. Was the fault with the old covenant with the law or with them? Remember when God gave the Ten Commandments, the children of Israel said, all the Lord has said, we will do. We will do. And they did not keep their word. The new covenant is, I will write my law in their hearts. The old covenant is, we will. The new covenant is, I will, God says. The old covenant is written on stone. The new covenant is the same law, but it's written where? In the heart. See, the problem was never with the law. And these people who say we're not under the law, they don't really mean that because you say, is it okay now to use God's name in vain? Well, no. Is it okay to steal? No. Is it okay to lie? No. Of course not. But now it must be done from love. We're not doing it to be saved. We're doing it because we are saved and because we love Him. Number 10. Upon what law is the new covenant based? Hebrews 8.10. For this is the covenant that I will make, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them in their hearts. You know, when we sin, it hurts us. When we sin, it hurts others and it hurts God. The great commandment is to love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. You notice that great commandment includes everybody. Love the Lord and love your neighbor as you love yourself. I heard someone say that the true meaning of happiness is spelled J-O-Y. Jesus, others, and then you. The world has turned that equation upside down where they say, you take care of yourself first and then take care of others, you know, humanitarian, and then if there's time left, we'll think about God. But no, God says, I come first. Love me with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Then you love your neighbor, and then when you give, you'll be happy. We, we have everything inverted backwards. Number 11. Does living under grace by faith make keeping God's law non-essential? Romans 6, 15. What then? Shall we sin, break God's law, because we're not under the law but under grace? What does Paul say? God forbid. Romans 3, 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. When we have faith, we establish the law. We don't nullify or negate or make void the law by faith. Paul says in Romans chapter uh, 3 verse, or what is it? Romans chapter 2 verse 13. It is not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. God wants us to obey. The Bible says we've got so many people that say, Lord, Lord, and they do not the will of their Father in heaven. What is the will of God? No, wait. Let me back up. First, I want to string you along. How many of you agree with me that God wants us to do His will? Amen. That it's, it's critical to our relationship with the Lord. What is the will of God? Psalms 40, verse 8. Yea, I love to do thy will. Thy law is within my heart. When you've got the law of God in your heart, you'll want to do the will of God. That's the way it needs to work. And the more time you spend looking at God, you'll develop a love relationship with Him. I've been to traffic school several times. I don't know how many times, but I could teach the course. <laughs> you haven't been 
I haven't been lately. My insurance is actually clean now because I think I've learned my lesson. You got to look in all your mirrors. <laughs> but uh, more than once I've been pulled over, and you know that sinking feeling. You know, one time, I don't know what I was thinking. I was driving down the road. I had just come off a highway where the speed limit was like 65 or 70, and I was in that mode, and then I went on another highway where it was 55, and I wasn't even paying attention, and I passed a highway patrolman. He wasn't parked on the side. I drove past him. I'm a deep thinker, and I don't know what I was thinking about that day. He then pulled me over. And he said, well, you weren't going that fast, but I felt kind of silly because I was following someone and you passed me. I said, oh, officer, please have mercy. My insurance rates are going to go up. My wife will never let me forget about this. Can you have mercy on me? He said, I tell you what, I'm going to let you go. Now, I didn't want to pull over when the lights started, those blue and red lights in my rear view mirror. I didn't want to pull over, but you know what? I'd broken the law. The law said 55. I was going 65. And when I broke the law, I was under the curse, the authority of the law. I had places to go, but I had to pull over. When I said, have mercy on me, and I've actually said this several times. You know, sometimes what you do is you need to cry. I've tried it one time, and she did not give me a ticket. <laughs> so I figure girls can do it, you know. So I said, will you please have mercy on me? He said, okay, well, look, we'll let you go. And um, I said, I know I'm guilty. Have mercy on me. I just, I'm honest with him. And he said, we'll let you go. Matter of fact, he said, I'll pay your ticket. <laughs> no, no, he didn't really say that. But he said, I'll let you go. So now that he said you're forgiven, I'm not under the law. As soon as he says you're forgiven and you're free to go, I'm now under what? When you're under grace, you know what that means. You understand the true meaning of that. That means then, as you get back in your car, you rev your engine, and you put it in second gear, and you pop your clutch, and you peel away doing donuts and leaving a black streak up the highway, and you can now go 85 miles an hour because I'm not under the law. I'm under grace now. Is that what that means? Oh, no. You know what I did because I was under grace? I turned on my turn signal. I looked both ways. I got out and kicked all the tires. I put it in first gear. I slowly let out the clutch. I waited until there was no one for a half mile in any direction on the road. And I creeped out and I went 52 and a half miles an hour because I was under grace. I was more careful than anybody to obey because I'm not under the law, but I'm under grace. You got the idea? When Paul says we're not under the law, he says because of Jesus, we're not under the penalty of the law. Therefore, we are more careful than anybody to show our love and appreciation and do God's will. Other people turn that around like not under law is a license to crucify Jesus again and again every day. That's a doctrine of devils, friends. That's not what the Bible is teaching. If we are going to understand these final issues, we need to understand the relationship about the law. Question number 12. Are people saved by keeping the law? No. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift he gives us. We all have broken God's law, but he wants to now not only give us forgiveness for the past, God wants to give you power to be different in the present. Amen? Number 13, what motivates a person to obey God's law? Because I want to go to heaven, and I don't want to go to hell. Now that might be a starting point, but what's the best reason to obey God? Love. love for the Lord has to be the reason. It says in Romans 3.10, Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then you can read in 1 John 5.3, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. You know, when we really love the Lord, we want to obey Him. Number 14, can I be a true Christian without keeping His commandments? What does the Bible say? 1 John 2, 3 and 4, Hereby do we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments is a a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
Now, some people say, oh, Doug, you're making too much emphasis on the letter of the law. The important thing is the spirit of the law. You know, we've got these people who think the spirit is, is license for disobedience. When Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to lust after her in his heart, he's committed adultery, he was explaining the spirit of the seventh commandment. The law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said it's not just an action, it's an attitude, right? The law says, thou shalt not kill. That's the letter of the law. The spirit of the law says if you're angry with your brother without cause, Jesus said, you're guilty of murder. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Jesus said, let all your communications be yea, yea, or nay, nay. You don't need to be swearing. Now, if a person says, we don't need to keep the letter anymore, we keep the spirit, that's absurd. The letter is the starting point. You build on that with the spirit. A person says, no, I, I, don't, I don't keep the letter anymore. I don't think about adultery, but I rape people. Obviously, if you're keeping the spirit, you're not going to break the letter, right? Oh, no, I, would, I, would, uh, I, I love my brother. I don't think angry thoughts. I do commit murder, but I'm not angry when I do it. If you're breaking the spirit of the law, you're always breaking the letter. And so this idea that we keep the spirit, if you're really keeping the spirit, it always includes the letter of the law. That's a, an important issue many forget. Number 15. Are some Old Testament laws no longer binding upon Christians? Yes. Ephesians 2.15. Having abolished the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now you realize that back in the very beginning, God had the Ten Commandment law. You remember when Cain killed Abel, God said to Cain, sin lieth at your door. Sin is a transgression of the law. It was a sin to murder back there in the Garden of Eden. When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife, Joseph said, how can I commit this sin against God? Adultery was a sin, and that was long before the Ten Commandments were written or spoken by God. So the Ten Commandments go all the way back. But certain ceremonial laws were given to Moses that revolved around the sanctuary and its services, and there were some ceremonial Sabbath days and holidays. These things all pointed to Jesus to help us recognize him. Those things were written on paper and were nailed to the cross. You can't nail stone to anything. And it says the handwriting of these things were nailed to the cross, but the Ten Commandments were not nailed to the cross. That was part of the ceremonial law, but the contained in a yearly Sabbaths, but the moral law and the Ten Commandments is eternal. Number 16, whom does the devil especially hate in the last days? Answer, the dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, who does the dragon represent? He's angry with the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed that keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. The devil in the last days, prophecy tells us, is especially angry with the people who keep God's commandments. Can you see how this ties into prophecy? Yes. The devil has an all-out war against the law because it brings people to Jesus. Number 17, what are some of the glorious rewards of keeping God's law? John 15, verse 11, these things I've spoken unto you that your joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Proverbs 29, verse 18. He that keepeth the law, miserable is he. Happy is he. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing will offend them. You will have great peace. Now, friends, I want to give you something to think about. Palestine, or Jerusalem, is in what we call the Holy Land. You know why it's called the Holy Land? You go all around the world, and people from Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, they call that the Holy Land. In the middle of the Holy Land, many years ago, was the temple. In the middle of the temple was the Holy of Holies. In the middle of the Holy of Holies, in the Holy Land, on the Holy Mountain, was the Ark of the Covenant, a golden box. What was inside that box? God wrote his will for the human race in stone. Isn't it interesting? Everyone wants to find the lost golden Ark of the Covenant. They're more interested in the golden box. What God was really interested in is the rocks in the box, written with the finger of God. That's the thing that matters. God doesn't want us just to be hearers of the word. He wants us to be doers of the word because Jesus died for our disobedience. You know, friends, 
Many people misunderstand how it grieves the Lord and how much it costs the Father for us to be forgiven. I sometimes wish we could be transported back in time and see what Jesus endured that we might be forgiven. During the days of Oliver Cromwell, a young man who was a soldier fell asleep guarding his post. The penalty for that was death. And he was to be executed at curfew with the ringing of the church bell. Well, when the time came for the soldier to be executed, his fiancée that loved him desperately climbed the bell tower. She got inside the bell and held on with her whole body to this mammoth clapper inside the bell. And Cromwell gave the order that they should ring the bell, and they tried to ring it and ring it, and they couldn't even get a muffled thud out of the bell. On investigation, pretty soon, they found this lady was up there all cut and broken and bruised and bleeding. And they asked her what was going on. She said, I'm his fiance. I love him. Please don't ring the bell. Cromwell said, curfew will not ring tonight. And the man was forgiven. You know, we are under a death penalty. And we have no concept how much Jesus has suffered that we might be forgiven. Have you accepted that forgiveness? When you invite him into your heart, then you want to do his will. Don't worry about how you might obey him tomorrow. You can't even comprehend that. You come to him just as you are today, friends, and he will change your life. He'll give you a new heart. I'd like for John to come out and sing a verse of a familiar hymn as you pray about what you will do with Jesus. Oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Oh, wonderful Savior to Let's bow our heads together. Father in heaven, bless these people, each one. Fill them with your spirit and help us to build firmly on the rock so when the storm comes, we may stand. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you in our next meeting.